Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a Thursday morning, and that means it's talking tax with Tom Yamachika. And today we're talking about a tax frenzy at the legislature. I mean the state legislature. I do not mean the Congress. They have their own kind of frenzy, uh, and uh, one has to pull one's head out of what's happening in Congress in the impeachment in order to focus on the local legislature. But we need to do that, too, uh, in the hope the country will survive. Anyway, so the tax... The tax is having a frenzy this session because we have a problem, Houston, on, on balancing the budget. So, Tom, you've been following this. We've been talking about it. What's the state of the frenzy over tax? You know, you would never know that we have an economic problem uh, from the looks of some of the bills that are being debated and passed. Uh, there are credit bills aplenty. There are tax exemption bills aplenty. Uh, there are, you know, of course, bills for new and more dangerous things. Uh, there are some really, really innovative bills, uh, and we'll talk about some of those. Uh, but uh, I am personally following uh, about 200 bills right now, uh, and these are just the bills that have gotten a hearing. There, there are a lot of probably fringe content bills that will never be heard. They won't see the light of day. Uh, they've still been introduced and we have, you know, d uh, brief descriptions of those on our website. But even for the ones that have, you know, had a hearing and supposedly have some legs, I, I have eight pages uh, full of notes about those, uh, those bills. I haven't counted them, but they're probably like 150 or 200 bills. Well, we could spend uh, the time going through uh, all of them, but I, I don't think that's going to work out. I think we have to identify the ones that are most interesting and, and threatening and, and possibly useful. Uh, can you talk about those, a handful of them anyway? Sure. Uh, one of the bills that's being considered by the Senate is uh, what we call the maintenance of effort bill. Uh, this is Senate Bill 815. And, and what that is, uh, is... The, the, the bill is designed to uh, keep the funding level for the Department of Education the same for year to year. So what it says is that if uh, for any reason uh, the, uh, well, not any reason, there, there, there are exemption provisions in it, but, but for, uh, in the most part, if the appropriated amount to the Department of Education goes down, okay, then the difference is immediately sequestered from the general fund and uh, f from, from the general excise tax collections and put into a stabilization fund for the Department of Education, which then can use it for any budgeted program, period. Okay. Now- Wow, that's pretty aggressive, isn't it? It, it is aggressive. Uh, not only that, but uh, the-, the um, uh, I, I would imagine that the bill was drafted by a non-lawyer because uh, uh, there, there are all kinds of technical problems with the bill. Uh, for example, uh, if if the legislature decides to raise the appropriation to the Department of Education, okay, uh, and that creates a difference too. And that's sequestered from the general excise tax and put into the stabilization fund, even though that's not what the, the bill is designed for. The, the bill is designed to, to, to do a backstop in case the, the appropriation goes down. But it works in reverse too, and I, I'm not really sure the drafters intended that. Well, it's interesting because it, you know, it suggests that uh, the drafter has no confidence in the legislature to maintain an appropriate level of funding. Um, it also, you know, to me, don't we have a bill or a, a combination of bills pending to scoop out and repeal these special funds. This is creating another one, isn't it? You look at every other bill in the legislature this year seems to create a special fund. Huh. Um, and and the, the reason that, uh, that people are doing this is because they're swayed by the argument that a special fund will create a dedicated funding source for this program or that program. But the reality is one legislature can't bind the next. So two years from now or one year from now or, you know, 
next, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, a law can be passed to repeal uh, the maintenance of effort provisions, even if they do pass. It all sounds very inconsistent with the notion of taking the money out of the existing special funds, and now people want to create new special funds. So which way are we going? Which one, Tom, is better fiscal policy? It's, I think, the, the, the far better fiscal policy is to get rid of the special funds. Uh, you, you, you have to let the legislature do its appropriation business. And it does that by considering all of the revenues and all of the expenses, prioritizing uh, them for the good of the state and funding it accordingly. Uh, but this, this uh, you know, very much frightens uh, people in certain constituencies because they think, oh my God, the legislature is going to defund us or they're going to drop our budget. So we, we can't have this happen. We have to do something about it. So, so, so they want a pot of money, a special fund, uh, that presumably is immune from, from legislative oversight so they can spend their money the way they want it, even if the legislature doesn't, doesn't agree with them. You can quote me, Tom. But if you want to create a special fund with a pot of money that doesn't have to be spent right now, you're taking it out of somebody else's hide. And so you're creating a priority. Furthermore, you're spending money at a time, money that doesn't go anywhere right now, at a time when we are in desperate straits over the budget. Yeah, and one of the things that, that I've been talking about uh, you know, over the past weeks and months uh, is that we have uh, excess money sitting around in some of these special funds. So uh, so my point is, why do we want to raise taxes or why do we want to do furloughs if we can use uh, this money that's been you know sitting around idle uh, to better effect? We've we got to repurpose this stuff. If the money isn't you know, if the money isn't uh, doing its intended job, well, let's make it do a you know let, let's make it work for the people. I want to talk about some more of these bills, but, but I'd like to interject one point of discussion. And that is, if we had, if we are in desperate straits, which I believe we are, and I believe you believe that too, uh, then what are the priorities that the legislature should be attending to? What are the, what are the top flight, you know, three or four things that it must do in order to save the state from the, you know, the, the problems of, a, of an unbalanced budget? Well, uh, th that, that's an interesting question uh, because education is, is one of our top needs. I, I think everybody can agree upon that. Uh, the, the degree to which uh, that's being implemented, you know, that's open to debate, but uh, certainly it is uh, one of our uh, top priorities. Uh, tourism is our our number one uh, economic driver. So we, so we have to support that. Uh, we have to deal with environmental threats like invasive species, uh, sea level rise, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, there are uh, infrastructure needs that we have in our education system, both in higher and lower education. Uh, UH and the schools are falling apart. We got to fix that. Uh, if we, you know, too, too, for too long, uh, we have you know, deferred the maintenance and now it's coming back to bite us. Yeah, so we're spending many tens of millions on a new stadium. Somehow that doesn't really, doesn't really calculate. 350 million, yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of the price tag that's on it right now. That's really the wrong time, the wrong, the wrong and. Thing. And you know one of the one of the uh, provisions uh, is is going to sound very familiar to you. Uh, it's a proposed constitutional amendment to remove the exclusivity of the counties over the real property tax. Now, um, what that would mean is that the state could impose a real property tax like it did once upon a time. But uh, the the legislators have. Uh, tried to sweeten the pot by uh, by saying it goes hand in hand uh, with another 
a bill or, or a couple of bills. And the idea for that, uh, for those bills, is to phase out the individual income tax. So it goes to zero in 2030. And, uh, you know, I did some calculations. And it turns out that the individual income tax is one of our one of our top producers. Um, it provides what two and a half billion dollars to run our government. And if you want to replace that with property tax, what you would have to assess on all properties is like seven percent, which is seventy dollars per thousand of assessed valuation. Right now, people are paying uh, between three and fifteen dollars. Three, three being residential and fifteen dollars being commercial. Uh, you know, it's 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 kind of uh, it varies by county and 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 by by property classification. But that's kind of around the range that you pay. If, if I do that, if the state does that, I'm not saying it's a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea at all. But um, then it has an effect on the real estate market, doesn't it? It has an effect on foreign investment coming and buying Hawaii property. Uh, well, more a, more immediately, it has it has an effect on the county budgets. Absolutely. Uh, if if you add, like you know, if if the if the county is charging you know fifteen dollars per 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 thousand, and the state adds another seventy, uh, and the homeowner can't pay both, uh, you know who's going to get what? So 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 the counties are are you know they're going nuts because this is threatening their their number one. Uh, financing system. Well, that'll so, mean that they're at, at the at the at the call of the state. In other words, uh, at the mercy of the state, they'll have to well, get their that's funding. That's what they're worried about. That's that's why that's why the counties are opposing uh, this particular measure very very fiercely. Yeah, they should be, because the state may not be reliable in terms of providing them with the necessary funding. See all kinds of inequities coming out of that. Um, but, but, you know, this goes back to a, a complaint that I make to you all the time. I said, why do these legislators take any bill that comes down the pike on state issues um, and drop it in the hopper so we all have to chase around? So well, they all have to chase around dealing with cockamamie bills, bills that are obviously of no value uh, and, and, and are, that are trouble. Uh, why don't they just say no? Well, because they have constituents who are depending on them. Like um, uh, for the the constitutional amendment bill, uh, the HSTA is in strong, strong support. They they want their uh, their teachers to be properly funded and get raises, and and they think this is the way to solve the problem. Uh, I I don't think it is, but they think it is, and uh, that's why they're pushing this bill. So as a practical matter, it's going to keep moving forward. Uh, the question becomes whether it's going to survive the last leg. But I don't, uh, I don't, I don't actually, uh, I don't believe the legislature, or for that matter, the what do you want to call it, the constituent public or the constituent unions, don't appreciate that we have a fiscal crisis on our hands. Furthermore, I noticed that in your list of priorities, you did not mention the incentivization of entrepreneurship, uh, of technology, of new businesses. And so uh, year after year, we may get some discussion of it, but we never actually get bills, at least not these days, that would pretend to incentivize businesses for young people and the like um, and to build a better economy. We still have this notion of going back to tourism. Well, uh, that's what we have now. Uh, at least we have some mature infrastructure for, for tourism. Um, the last time we tried to, you know, give a shot in the arm to the tech industry, uh, we really didn't know what we were doing, and uh, and the incentive program collapsed around us, uh, not you know because of the good actors, but because of the bad actors. Now the legislature, in the end, killed it before the sunset. Talking about Act Two Twenty One, but there was no replacement. It's been more than ten years since it died. Uh, in an early and intentional sunset. And so we have nothing to replace it. I find it interesting how short our memories are, but also interesting that it's not in the priorities, not in the, in the list you gave and not in the list that any legislator would give right now. 
there's no champion um, to try to incentivize young people to make businesses or even to stay here. And I don't think the legislature realizes how important that is. Yeah, certainly uh, you would need an, an organization like the Chamber of Commerce to kind of spearhead advocacy around you know, around that kind of thing. But I think you have to kind of define the uh, the universe a little bit more tightly uh, so people know what to focus on. Uh, I mean, just describe just describing it as entrepreneurship, uh, it, you know, sounds kind of vague. And, uh, you know, at least in these times with resources being as scarce as they are, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it sounds like betting on, uh, you know, betting on a long shot. Well, you know, that's and, the and same argument that is. was... That was the same argument that was made around 221. Uh, we don't have the money to spend on a long shot. Um, so we're not going to spend anything. And uh, we're not going to try to refine it. We're not going to try to focus it. We're not going to try to you know, be smarter about it. We just dropped the whole idea. And, and that's what happened. And I don't think they realize that the way you improve the tax base is you, you have to improve the economy in general. And we're really not, you know, I say, we're, as far as I can see, we're not doing yeah, I mean, certainly one of the things that we've been saying all along is that you need to take care of the economic engine. That's, uh, you know, that's where the tax money comes from. If if people don't do business, there's no tax. And if there's no tax, there's no revenue. So, uh, you know, you look at all of our major tax types, they're based on business of some kind. General excise provides half of our general fund budget. It's a business privilege tax. The individual income tax is driven by withholding. Uh, on wage earners. So if there's no business, there's no withholding and there's no tax. And, you know, every every single tax type other than those two, when put together, uh, doesn't generate, you know, as, as much as the individual income tax. So, you know, that's kind of how our how our tax structure is. Well, can you have some more bills you want to mention? Sure. Uh, the the concept of a carbon tax keeps coming up, and uh, this year is no exception. Uh, House Bill 1319 uh, changes the barrel tax uh, into a carbon tax and uh, sets it at a price of uh, $40 per metric ton in 2022, phasing up to $80 per metric ton in 2032. And what that would do is that would uh, add when you when you you know get down to like cents per gallon, you know, so you, so you can understand if you go to the pump, uh, you want to fill up your tank. Uh, it would add fifty four cents per gallon at the end of its implementation, and this does tax. Lot. That's a lot. Just tax. So you, <laughs> we're already paying you know lots of money per gallon already, uh, and this is going to be a whole lot more now. Uh, some people think the investment's worth it. Uh, more power to them. Uh, we just need to have a good debate on on what's you know what's good and what's not good social policy. But that's but that's out there. I mean, and it's uh, I think it's going to be a shock for uh, for people who have to drive for their business. Uh, you know, I'm I'm talking trucking companies, for example. I'm talking traveling salespeople. I'm I'm talking about you know pretty much anybody. Who, who who relies on wheels to get uh, you know to get around in their uh, in their chosen occupation? So where are these where are these bills coming from? Another digression, if you don't mind. Are they coming from the governor? Has he got a package? Has he got a solution for us? Is he stepping up and saying, "Look, I know we got a crisis, the fiscal crisis. We can't balance the budget. Um, here's my solution. Here are some bills, administration bills." We're getting any bills from him? We're getting bills from him, uh, but none that I would characterize as economic leadership. Um, he he's also allowing departments to testify against each other if they if they if they so choose, which which I think is um, uh, very interesting. I mean, when when I was working for government, uh, which is in the mid nineteen nineties. And uh, you know, Waihei and Kaitana were the governors. Uh, agencies were not allowed to testify against each other. Uh, they would have to kind of like go to the governor's office and kind of hash out what what's what was best and what was in line uh, with the governor's priorities. Uh, but here, it's kind of more like a free for all. 
that's that's why you know I'm, I'm <laughs> that's one reason why I named this 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 uh, talking tax segment uh, you know the frenzy at the legislature because that's kind of what it is. Well, it sounds very inefficient to me. I I take it from what you say that you believe it, it's a better policy to hash it out in the governor's office than let him hash it out in committee and, um, and neutralize each other that way. Right. I mean, I think it's better for everybody uh, if. You know, if the governor comes up with, hey, here is this long term vision that I have. Uh, here are the steps that are going to be required to get there. Let's do it. Yeah, that certainly would be better. The second best would be that you had a few legislators who spent the time to understand fiscal policy and who came up with their bills. I mean, such as you, I shouldn't say, as you see in Congress today because you don't see anything much. Um, but uh, that you, that you used to see in Congress, where some legislator would step up and say, here's how we're going to address this problem. I am writing, me and my staff, we're writing a bill and we're submitting it under my name, and I am going to try to lead the effort on this bill. You see that in, in these tax bills here in this session? Not at all. Not at all. Um, I, have a, I have an entire page uh, of bills that were sponsored by the administration, looks like this. Um, most of them are not substantive. Uh, the, the ones sponsored by tax are not substantive uh, for the most part. Um, they they kind of chip away at at various administrative problems, you know, which is which is fine. They can do that. Um, the, the the budget and finance department, which which I think is normally taking the lead on economic measures, uh, what, what, what are they doing? Uh, they are suspending annual required contributions to the employer uh, union trust fund. Okay, we, we can't make the, the required payment, so let's, let's not do it for a couple of years. Um, uh, we raid special funds, which I think is a good idea if there's, if there's balances lying around, let's raid them and, and repurpose the monies. Um, we uh, suspend or have a distribution of the TAT to the counties. And, and that one is questionable uh, because uh, then, uh, you know, the, then the counties are hurting. It's already they happened have by, to... by, by, by fiat, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, by emergency proclamation, uh, the governor suspended all of that stuff going to the counties in May. And, they want to codify uh, that. They want to codify that for a long term. Well, yeah, I mean the the the, uh, the bill from budget and finance would uh, would have the distribution as opposed to stop it entirely like it is now. What about the tax office? Tom? Is the tax office putting bills in? Uh, they have lots, a uh, lot of, mostly technical amendments. Um. There, there is one that would uh, affect the transient accommodations tax, which nobody's paying right now because because our tourism is in the, in the toilet. Uh, but what it would do is uh, it would add a feature to the transient accommodations tax uh, that would require uh, personal guarantees, w whether you whether you know it or not. Um, so if you're a responsible person in a company, and uh, your company incurs TAT liability and it's not paid, then they go after your house. Is that, is that good fiscal policy? Uh, I had argued against it when it was being uh, debated on the general excise tax side. Uh, you know, it makes sense for things like uh, trust fund taxes, uh, like, for, like if you're an employer and you tell the government you're paying, uh, you know, a certain amount to an employee for withheld tax and you don't pay the tax over, okay? The employee's getting credit for it, whether or not the tax is paid to the government. But but you've basically stolen money from the government by not paying it over. So it wasn't your tax, it was the employee's tax, right? Uh, in, in, in that kind of situation, I can see going after the person individually, uh, you know, because there was some stealing going on. But, uh, the, the, the trust fund concept really doesn't apply to GE tax or, or TA or anything like it. 
Well, I, I, my immediate reaction is if you start assigning personal liability to corporate obligations, you're, you're piercing the corporate veil and you're piercing the investor veil. And what we need is public confidence in making investments, in taking risks, in starting new businesses, in bringing investment capital and using your own capital for investment capital to generate more economic activity so the tax base is better, higher, more robust, and then you get more taxes. And if you start assigning personal liability to what has been a corporate liability, you're discouraging people from taking risks and starting business. I know you're going to agree. Well, of course. I mean, uh, you know, if uh, if I wanted somebody to work for me, uh, and there was a chance that 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 they would get dragged down into the debts of, uh, the debts of my company, uh, why would they want to work for me? I mean, they would have to be insane. So in order for you know me to survive as a company, um, I, I need to kind of give my employees and my investors confidence that uh, you know the, the risks of, of the business are are manageable and something that, that they can live with, uh, not not something arbitrary that's been you know that's going to be put on them uh, as as a result of you know like working for me or owning part of my company. We do need some leadership here. So what other bills uh, should we be concerned about in the frenzy? Well, we, we are kind of running out of time and I got a whole bunch left. So so maybe we, we, we save uh, the additional bills for next time uh, when we have a better idea of, uh, you know, what bills are surviving and, uh, you know, which ones, which ones uh, fall by the wayside. Uh, there was there was one interesting one that did fall by the wayside. Thank God. Uh, there was a proposed telework credit. Uh, now you know telework is 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 something uh, that's you know good policy during a pandemic. Uh, but the way they define telework is uh, you know if you if you're not in the office more than you know fifty or sixty percent of the time. Well, if you're a construction laborer uh, or you're a traveling salesperson. You're not in the office fifty or you know fifty percent of the time. There's no way. So you, you give them telework credits too. Uh, in the end, the, the the committee chair kind of couldn't stomach it anymore, and he held the bill. He was right. There was, was an right. article in Civil Beat this very morning. I don't know if you saw it uh, about about uh, construction work and how it, it is um, you know it has done well in in the time of COVID. And it is likely to do well going forward. So we have to incentivize, not de-incentivize that kind of activity. Um, the, the other thing is, and, and we only have a minute you know, close here, but it just seems to me uh, there ought to be an examination of Christmas future here. So Tom, I give you a situation where there is no leadership in these tax bills or ways to deal you know, with the imbalance of the budget, the deficit coming. Um, deficit, already, deficit already here. Um, and, I, and I give you a situation where nothing is being done to incentivize uh, new business and uh, uh, to you know build up the, the economy and the tax base in such a way that we have more people paying more tax. Uh, what's, what's the future of that? It seems to me that one thing is you, uh, you accelerate the departures of, of young people who are looking for opportunities. Yeah, that's away. that's happening already. Another people, thing is people are getting on planes and leaving. Yes, they are. And they're, they're not coming they're, back. Yes, not coming back. Unless you go to the mainland and start something, it's not likely you're going to come back. And then, of course, the other thing is is offshore investment coming to Hawaii. If we don't incentivize that, especially now, it won't come. And of course, you you want to shape how it comes and what kind of business, and you want to manage it so nobody abuses it. But you can do that. And I, and I don't think we've done that. So in, in, a, in the ghost of Christmas future, if we don't attend to these things, um, what happens? Uh, then lots of people leave and, you know, the rest of us uh, are kind of scratching our heads because, you know, we're, you know, picking up the slack for them. 
you know, the government's still going to exist and it's still going to employ people and it's still going to do programs. Uh, and it's going to, you know, prop up the uh, the lowest of us and um, it's got to, re it's got to, you know, it can't print money. We can't print money. So we got to have that money come from somewhere. And that somewhere is going to be, you know, the, you know, the, the few of us who are left and, and who are foolish enough to obey the law. <laughs> well, you know, it seems to me that the kind of government we want, the kind of um, landscape we want fiscally and economically here is, is it's we have to work for that and we need leadership for that. Uh, and if we don't have that, this is not going to be a kinder, gentler place. It'll be uh, a place where political twist means more even than it already does. And where the guy in the bottom of the pole gets the worst possible deal. And so if we want to have an egalitarian, fair-minded state, a state of aloha, we really have to make the economy better. We have to make the government think about these issues and not respond to demands by powerful um, interests uh, that would serve their own interest and not, not the interest of the community in general. That's right. I mean, uh, we're, we're in a process where we've got a lot of pain. Uh, we've got people dying. We have people being sick. Uh, we have to spread the pain around. So, it, so each of us, you know, bears a little bit of it. Uh, we can't have people getting off scot-free. Um, you know, people have to kind of pull together and, and we have to be united in facing the challenges that we have uh, until we can you know, turn the situation around and get ourselves uh, up, up off the floor and, you know, starting to starting to move forward again. Yeah, pull together, in a word. Tom Yamachika, President of Tax Foundation of Hawaii, thank you so much for coming around. Thanks for having me on the show, Jay.